think a run like that has to change it. You know, you think, oh my God, this fella can do anything, look what he does. No, I'm, I'm, I am just a normal fella who did something that was pretty big. So I jacked my job in and sort of realised that this was going to be the opportunity. If I was ever going to be able to do it, it'd be now. I'd looked into the route that Forrest had done and nobody had ever done it before. Five oceans, 43 states, four major injuries, seven punctures, 33 pairs of shoes, 15,621 miles, 422 days, an average of 37 miles a day. All right, lad. Did I ever tell you about the time I ran across America? Early life, uh, I'm from Croxteth, so I'm in my local park. Did a lot of me running around here, and. Um, yeah, so to, you know, went to school, did a little bit of cross country. Um, wasn't really especially good. I was one of the best in the school, like, but I was never going to go to the Olympics. And uh, yeah, happy life. Went to uni down in uh, London, qualified as a vet, worked as a vet for a few years, and uh, eventually went off to Australia. And I uh, lived there for three years, and that's where my running took off. I came 10th in the Sydney Marathon. But because I'd lived in Australia for a few years, I was a qualified Australian. And so um, I was officially uh, the 2015 Australian men's marathon champion. And I get a phone call that day as I'm just walking down the streets in Sydney, trying to take it all in from a fella called Chris Muirden, who was the head of their athletics. And he goes, if you come in the top 10 in an IAAF gold race, you automatically qualify for the Olympics. So um, you've qualified for Rio. Congratulations, and I was just like, what does that mean? And he goes, well, um, we've got a few people who are trying to get the qualifying time, and if they go faster than you, with them being actually Australian, they will get picked ahead of you. But if they don't get the qualifying time, would you consider switching nationality? And I was just like, yeah. <laughs> I'd, have been a, I'd have been burning the Union Jack quicker than you could say, Walter Matilda. <laughs> I'd wanted to run across America for about 15 years by the time I started, um, but it's obviously a fairly big undertaking. It's not something you can just get off and do. And I found out what date he started on, which was September the 15th, 1979. And so it was around March, and I was like, well, six months, here we go. And I uh, thought I would do loads of planning, but instead all I did was just look at cool stuff that I could see on the way. And <laughs> Which is probably the best planning, you know. You didn't see Forrest doing a load of training before and he just put his shoes on and went. And in the big scheme of things, eventually that's pretty much what I did. I was roughly following a route that Forrest was doing and I took that from uh, a map that appears behind a newsreader in one of the, uh, the, the, you know, one of the scenes in the movie. We looked in how we were going to do it and we thought, well, do we... Um, go in a car, say we, that's me and my girlfriend, now wife, Nadine, and um, do we hire a car and stay in motels? And we just realised that was going to eat money. Then we thought, do we hire an RV? And that was so expensive. So we thought, well, what we've got to have to do is just use our savings, buy one and gamble on selling it at the end, you know? And so um, we saw this big RV in Houston and uh, Nadine sort of took it on a test drive on like the busiest like interstate in, in like America it seemed. First time she'd been driving on that side of the road in a 30 foot RV. But uh, we leave that in Houston and we get the mega bus to uh, New Orleans, hire a car, go to Mobile and we hire a car and motel it for the first sort of, you know, couple of weeks until we got to Houston and then we were on the way. So yeah, ran through Joshua Tree National Park, which is like one of the most beautiful places ever. Listened to the Joshua Tree by U2 the whole time I was running through. Um, and then eventually got to my first ocean, which was Santa Monica Pier. And of course, Forrest runs along that pier and decides that he's 
just since he's gone that far, he's going to turn around and keep on going. And that's what I did. So this registration plate was the, uh, was on the front of my stroller, Pram Solo, uh, who I called because I was starting to look a lot like Chewbacca. And uh, some good pals of mine got me this at the Bubba Gump restaurant at Santa Monica, minutes after I'd reached my second ocean. So this is the original, uh, the one that took me through the whole journey. See the colour now, well, that was the same colour once. It's inside, and I thought that was sweat and just washing it, but then I realised that it was all red inside, so that's just the sun. That's what happens if you go running through the desert, so always remember your sunscreen, people. <laughs> Were there any states that I didn't really rate? Yeah, there was actually, and it was the biggest surprise of the, uh, of the trip. I'd met some people who were cycling across uh, America and they met me in Oklahoma and they said that Tennessee was really bad for them. And I was really worried about Tennessee because hey, I didn't really know what to expect from it apart from like Dolly Parton and Johnny Cash. But um, I knew that I was going to be going from being supported in the RV to being on my own and finally getting Pram Solo, my stroller out. Uh, because we're just running out of money, you know, stuff, and Nadine had to go home, and so I was really worried about it. But uh, ever from the first day, you know, like I met somebody straight away, and like he was dead friendly, and I ended up getting to stay in somebody's trailer on the first night. Now, I nearly thought I was going to get killed. I'd met somebody who said that um, they just knocked on people's doors and sort of, you know, asked to camp in their yard. But then I knocked on this one door and there was no answer. So I was just like, oh, fair enough. And I was about to walk away when the blind switch and this fella goes, who is it? And I'm like, eh, uh, Rob from England. <laughs> and he goes, what do you say? And uh, he didn't answer. So I then finally sort of uh, just walk away and I'm just turning around and then his door opens. He goes, what do you want? And I'm like, I was just doing this, can I, you know, sort of camp in your front yard, and he just went, so you got any weapons on you? And I'm like, uh, no, mate, I'm English, just my razor sharp wit. He just went, good, because I got plenty. And he just pulls out this 10 inch, like, kitchen knife from behind his back, and I'm just like, oh my God. I said, it's day one, and I'm already going to get killed. And uh, he uh, basically explained to what I was going to do, and he goes, hang on, I'm going to call my wife, see if you can call, uh, camp around the back of the local store. So he goes in and he comes back out 20 seconds later. No way he's made that phone conversation. And he just goes, it's OK, I trust you. Come in. And I'm like, oh, God. And uh, unfortunately, his little daughter was with him, like about two or three year old. And so I figured he probably wasn't going to, uh, you know, cut me up in front of her. And he ended up making me a chili, giving me a can of Coke, let me stay in his little hunting trailer by the side of his house. and. Then that was the start of it. Everybody I met in Tennessee was just super, super friendly and it just gave me the confidence to go on. Unfortunately, sort of when I was running, I did see a lot of evidence of climate change. You know, sort of, um, I was running through Arizona and um, I ran past uh, the Gila River and it was basically you know, a really wide river, you know, so you look at about sort of, you know, 20 metres, 30 metres across and it was just like a few puddles in it. And then to the side of it, there was like a big concrete channel that was chock-a-block full of water. And, you know, all the fields, were, they were in the desert, right? And the fields were green. And just like, why are you growing stuff here? You know, there's no, there's no, there's no business to be to, you know, pumping fertilizer in and stealing the water. One of the saddest things I saw was uh, in Glacier National Park, which is pretty much hands down the most beautiful place I've ever been. Imagine why it's called Glacier National Park, because of glaciers, but by 2030, there aren't going to be any glaciers there at all, you know, sort of it just, and that, that's a direct thing of global warming. It is bonkers, it's, you know, you see some extremes out there, you know, I went from uh, minus 18 to, I think, plus 43 was the hottest, so a 60 degree shift, but that's America for you, it's got all the climates and all the environments. Well, the big thing for me was I was running for two charities, and that's the uh, World Wildlife Fund and Peace Direct. 
And when Forrest runs across the Mississippi for the fourth time, he gets pursued by a pack of reporters and they just go, you know, why are you running? And of course he says, I just felt like running. Uh, but they asked him, are you running for women's rights, world peace, the environment, the homeless and animals? And between those two charities, they covered everything. So whenever I really struggled, I'd done more than your average sponsored run. And I'd raised a good bit for charity and stuff, but I knew it was never going to raise what I wanted to do unless the whole thing was done. So there was never any option of quitting. The only way I was going to quit was if I physically didn't have any money to continue, um, if I was physically broken, because mental side of things, I wasn't going to allow myself to give up. And even if you were going to throw it in, you'd probably have to run 20 miles to get to the nearest bus stop or, you know, sort of civilization anyway. So just get on with it, don't you? You'd be really bummed out at the end of one of your bad days and you'd be so tired, you'd run 50 miles, you were hungry, you just wanted to eat and go to bed, do your messages and then that's it. And you'd be like, I just can't be bothered being social tonight. But someone would open a door to you and you'd be like, hey, how's it going? And they were excited and you'd think, oh, I'll, give them f I'll tell them the story, I'll tell them how my day's been for five minutes. Four hours later, you'd just be chatting away and you'd be feeling so much better, you know. I've stayed with hunters, I've stayed in like really poor areas, I've stayed in rich areas and the common thing that runs through I think is a general theme of kindness and that's what I want to know. It's not about making America great, it's just stop making America crap. <laughs> What's next? Well, <laughs> I've definitely got unfinished business with the States, you know, because like um, where Forest finishes is in Monument Valley and that is not the ocean and i don't really want to be explaining to people 20 years times why i only ran 4.7 times across america so i want to do that but there's also like seven states that i haven't run across which is alaska hawaii florida south dakota iowa rhode island and west virginia as well so i want to join those bits up with the main bit of the route um, alaska and hawaii might be a bit difficult but the others i'm going to tie up um, and then the biggest bit of unfinished business is why I bought the stroller in the first place and that's to run across Australia. So I'm not sure yet whether I would do it supported because uh, <laughs> it is pretty desolate um, or whether I would do it with a pram solo. I think, I think I'll do a little bit of both. Oh, you're having me on lad. <laughs> <laughs>